should be working now. Oh, and I'll stop the transcription. Okay. Terrific. Okay, so welcome everybody um, to this presentation on trauma. Um, and as I mentioned, my name is Catherine Cora. I am the coordinator of the Center of Excellence for Behavior Management. Um, I did do a similar presentation, not as in detail, um, a, a couple years ago at your board. I did an int introduction to trauma and due to popular request, we decided to um, redo this presentation and I've brought it to the next level. So I will most definitely keep in mind uh, that the audience here is both elementary and high school. Um, because we're recording, if you have any questions, please note them down. And when we get to the part of me stopping to present and um, stopping the recording, then you'll be able to come up and to ask me your questions. Um, there's so many, um, so much literature out there on trauma. There's great books that are out there. Or there's wonderful websites that are out there. I've only put down here some of the very few um, that are the most uh, common um, authors in the in the field. So Bruce Perry, who wrote the book, um, I forget the title now of the book, uh, something about what about you? Um, and, and so uh, he wrote it, he co-wrote it with uh, Oprah Winfrey. So that was that's one really known author. The other one is Bessel van der Kolk. His work is a bit more um, scientific, um, and so not as easy as a, as a read as the Bruce Perry book. Peter Levine, um, out of the U.S., does a lot of of work around healing trauma. Gabor Mate is another one who wrote The Myth of Normal. One of our francophones in our province, uh, Delphine Colin Vizina. She's done a lot of work and research in the domain of trauma in Quebec. Um, other known authors in the US, Stephen Porges, who's a neuroscientist, and Mona de la Hook wrote a book. Oh, thank you so much, Ariane. Wrote a book called Beyond Behaviors. If you guys are interested in looking at that book, it's a wonderful read. And she has chapters dedicated to trauma. Um, a lot of our school boards have hired David Melnick. I believe that Central Quebec may have had him before. Um, and he is out of the U.S. as well and speaks a lot about trauma and about, um, you know, being able to go beyond just being trauma informed as a school to be able to really bring it to the next level. Um, and of course, the Australian Childhood Foundation has a lot of resources that are available and the ACEs study, which I will talk about um, in a moment. But before we get to the ACEs study, wanted to really quickly talk about what is trauma. I often get this question, um, what is considered trauma? What is not considered trauma? Where do we draw the line? Um, is it a certain event um, and so forth? Gabor Mate in his book, The Myth of Normal, uh, he, he cited the following, trauma is not what happens to you, but what happens inside of you, which means that you, uh, you know, a student, uh, whether an adolescent or a child, could have gone through a situation that one person may describe as traumatic and another person may not see it as such. But so it's not about the event itself, whether it's considered to be traumatic or not. It is how this event has impacted. And so if the person has become traumatized by that event, then the event is considered traumatic. Um, and so trauma, the word trauma literally means wound, injury or shock. Trauma is one possible uh, outcome of exposure to uh, what we call adversity. So adversity is basically um, difficult situations that are stressful, that can be wounding, and that, that can possibly cause harm. And if it does cause wounding or injury or shock, then that would lead to trauma. The word ACEs, by the way, is adverse childhood experiences. And so we're going to talk about that in a moment. Um, and so trauma occurs when a person perceives an event or a set of circumstances as extremely frightening, harmful, or threatening, either emotionally, physically, or both. Childhood adversity, which that study on the ACEs comes from this definition, is a broad term that refers to a wide range of circumstances or events that pose a serious threat to a child's physical or psychological well-being. Research shows that such experiences can have serious consequences, especially when they occur early in life, wh whether they are chronic or, and or severe, and, and if they accumulate over time. So all of these different elements will have an impact on whether 
adversity can become traumatic or not. The fact that it happened at a young age, the fact that it happened, uh, you know, quite frequently, intensely, and so forth, all of these are elements that will influence whether or not these incidences become traumatic or not. As Peter Levine points out, certainly all traumatic events are stressful, but not all stressful events are traumatic. So just to be able to differentiate between the two. So I mentioned adverse childhood experiences and all the studies that go with that. Um, adverse childhood experiences, the this, this study of those were, uh, were coined by a few authors um, who studied this back in the, in the mid-90s. So from 95 to 97, there were a, a, a group of researchers that looked at a subset of childhood adversities to see if those subset compared to other types of adversities if they made a difference on, on our well-being and on our long-term health. So the researchers asked adults, so it, it was not focused on children at first, it was focused on adults. They asked the adults about childhood adversities in seven different types of categories, whether they had had in their past physical uh, abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, having a mother who was uh, treated violently in the home, living with somebody who's mentally ill, living with someone who abuses alcohol and or drugs, and a, a family member who has been incarcerated, who's within that, that household. So those are the seven different types of categories that they looked at. And what they found as they compared those seven types to other types of adversity in life, that an adult who reported from their childhood on to have lived as much as four of these seven categories and more, that the more that they had accumulation of these different adversities, the worse that their physical and mental health outcomes were. So this would impact heart disease, substance misuse, depression, and so forth. Um, and so the researchers came to understand that there are some common events that, and especially if they've been accumulated, that they're chronic and that they've started at a very young age, that this has an impact on the person's health as they get older. So the term ACEs has since been adopted to describe a variety of a varying list of adversities. So it's no longer just the seven. As we've we've been studying this, we've recognized that there are other types of adversities that have that similar type of impact as those original four, those four, that sets of seven different types of adversities. So at this point, we've also added on parental divorce, especially if there's been high conflict. And, and separation and emotional and physical neglect. So it's not just the abuse in itself, but also the neglect that can have serious impact on the person's health. Other studies have added experiences of social disadvantage. So for example, um, economic um, hardship, homelessness, community violence, discrimination, um, historical trauma and so forth. Sorry, I'm just gonna mute the new person who just came in. Okay. And then um, no ACEs list or screening tool identifies all of these different types of childhood adversities uh, because there's so many of them. I mean, if we were to list them, there could be, you know, I would even say hundreds at this point. But those that, that uh, do not include adversity related to social disadvantage are likely to overlook children in specific, for example, racial or ethnic groups that are disproportionately affected. And so these things that have not been included in the list doesn't mean that they don't have that type of impact. Uh, oh, that was the title of the book. So what happened to you from Bruce Perry? So in one of the chapters in that book from Bruce Perry, they talk about all of the different elements that can also affect trauma. So it's not just childhood adversities that can that can bring forward forward trauma, but also genetics. And so if it's been shown that that genetically trauma can be passed down up to seven different generations. And so if we think about some of, of our, you know, the children or adolescents that we work with, namely, for example, or Aboriginal communities that, you know, their elders had, would have gone through a history of trauma back in, you know, back in their day in, in the past. It's not because the person did not live that trauma firsthand, that that trauma cannot be passed down from generation to generation. And as I'm saying, it can be transferred up to seven different generations. And so genetics has a huge component, the DNA. Um, there's even studies that have been done that has with rats that have shown that if you stress 
the female or the male rat. So it's not just the female, but also the male rat, and that you get those rats to then um, come together to have uh, babies, that uh, the babies are showing signs of distress. And so the babies have not gotten the distress directly, but through genetics passed down through the parents, they, they, um, that that's been passed down through the DNA. Um, in terms of uh, in utero, so as the mother, um, you know, is pregnant, the experience of life during the pregnancy, all of the stress that the mother can have during pregnancy um, can have an impact on the baby. Um, we know that it's through the umbilical cord that the mother is able to calibrate a, a part in the brain called the amygdala. And if the amygdala is is um, because the, it is not well calibrated because the mother herself was under stress during her pregnancy, then this has an impact on the child's ability to manage stress um, in terms of the birth experience. Um, and of course, anything in your environment after that. And so any type of adversity in life can have an impact. But it's just amazing how um, our system is done and how, um, you know, even if you haven't lived firsthand trauma, it doesn't mean that you don't have it passed down from your elders. I, I was mentioning the amygdala before and how the, the, the mother through in, in utero calibrates through the umbilical cord will calibrate the amygdala of the child. And so the amygdala is basically the center point of the limbic system. The limbic system is basically the emotional part of our brain. And so anything that goes through, um, you know, any type of emotion that we have or stress response all starts from that place of the limbic system. Of course, there's other parts of the brain that are involved in the in the stress response in terms of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic response and we'll talk about that later um but uh, the one of the central points is the amygdala the amygdala is basically the element that detects if there's threat in the environment and that will send a signal through the hypothalamus to the brain that there's danger in the environment and then from then on there will be a um, stress response within the body so when you guys hear the flight, fight, freeze response, the flight, fight, freeze actually Absolutely. comes from um, the hypothalamus. Uh, one second, there's somebody that I'm hearing right now that I want to mute. Give me a second. Um, just want to make sure. OK, we're good. So, um, and so when we're talking about the flight, fight, freeze response, it comes from the nervous system within the limbic system. It's normal for us to go in and out of what we call sympathetic and parasympathetic. Sympathetic is that flight, fight, freeze response. And so if our brain detects that there's danger in the environment, even if there's not true danger, it's the way that our brain will interpret it, then the body will go into what we call sympathetic mode where it will either fight, flight, or freeze. The fourth one that we don't talk about very much, which is the one called flock, is the one where if we're feeling in danger, our first um, reflex is to actually get near our loved ones for safety. And so that's the flocking. And, but we usually talk about the other three. And so it's normal uh, given the way that our system is built, that we go throughout a day, throughout a week, throughout a month, a year, it's normal that we go in and out of sympathetic and parasympathetic. If our body picks up even slightly that there's a sense of something that's off, something that's wrong, something that feels, um, you know, wounding or dangerous or threatening, that our body will move into the stress response for survival purposes. And these are not things that we choose. These are things that happen to us. The way that our brain is made is, is uh, for survival purposes. And so if we were to have to think about whether or not there's a danger to react, chances are we would already be um, affected in our livelihood if we didn't just have the reflex. So our body is made in such a way that even if we haven't recognized or spoken of that danger, our body's already moved into that flight or fight or freeze response. And of course, once the brain has picked up that we're now into safety, now we're going from the sympathetic to the parasympathetic. So the parasympathetic is now bringing back to a state of calm where the, the, the heart rate will slow down, where we will you know, feel our emotions and so forth. 
So there's really a, a, a shift from that sympathetic where we're in the survival mode to that parasympathetic where we are in the rest mode. And so we will go in and out of these modes throughout even a, a, a single day. Um, the piece that we need to, to keep in mind is that the way that our brain works is that from the more primitive part of the brain through our senses and what we call interoception, it's the way that our body will pick up inside and outside of our world. This is how we will recognize whether or not there is danger. And, and if there isn't true danger, then our body will try to relate to it and to regulate ourselves and eventually get to reasoning. But if we are in full on stress response, it's very difficult for that person to be able to reason themselves out of their stress response, especially an individual who has a history of trauma. If their amygdala is not well calibrated and that they react intensely to a perceived danger, even if that danger is not true, then their whole system gets inundated and they have a very hard time to be able to regulate themselves, to relate to the situation at hand and to reason through. And so that's why we <clears throat> notice, you know, if we were to compare a child who has a history of trauma or a teen that has a history of trauma to an individual who doesn't, the difference in the way that they react to a stressor. So how does the brain, um, how does trauma, excuse me, affect the brain? And I think it's important for us to look at that to better understand why is it that at the foundation, a person who has a history of trauma will react very differently than a person who doesn't. Um, and so because of the way that that not only the brain will react different if there is future trauma, but the trauma itself from the past will change the way the brain works. Here's an image of on the left hand side, a healthy brain, a person who has not gone through a history of trauma. And, and because all of the, the safe conditions are there, they're able to be at rest enough to develop their brain functions. On the right hand side, you have an example of a, an individual who has gone through severe neglect and abuse from from birth. This was a Romanian child who was put through an orphanage and that lived severe neglect and abuse. And it's not that there's actual holes there in that brain. The reason why the sections here are dark is because they're not activated. So the matter is there. It is possible if all of the right conditions can come in place in their life later on and that they're able to find rest and that they will be able to grow these parts of the brain. But as long as those conditions are not ideal, as long as that person lives adversity on a chronic basis, the brain cannot both grow and survive. And so survival is the most important and growth is actually a luxury. And so if you look at that, that picture on the right hand side, the effort, the energy was put towards survival and not towards growth. And the parts of the brain that get the most affected are, for example, the temporal lobes, which are part of the limbic system. And this has to do with not being able to regulate your emotions and so forth. And the other section that's actually quite affected by it is what we call the prefrontal cortex, which is here at the front. And so at the front, we have, um, this is where we've got our filter to be able to regulate ourselves, to be able to slow down, to be able to reflect, to be able to learn from consequences and so forth. And so individuals who have a history of trauma, because the energy was put towards survival, have not well developed these parts of the brain. So it's not that they don't want to regulate themselves. It's not that they don't want to not overly react. They cannot do better because of the fact that they're lacking some ability there in their brain, it hasn't been, been fully developed. So there's basically two double invisible handicaps when it comes to the effects of trauma on the brain. The first one, I talked about the amygdala before, that is the center of the brain. Um, and so if the amygdala is what we call kindled, what that means is that it's not well calibrated and that it overly reacts to any situation, any perceived situation that might be dangerous. I'll show a chart uh, later on in the presentation and I'll come back to that, but you'll get to see in that chart what it looks like indifference between somebody who has an amygdala who's kindled versus somebody who has a regular well-calibrated amygdala. And on the right-hand side, 
um, this idea that if the corpus callosum and the prefrontal cortex, so the, co the corpus callosum is basically the black part here that brings the two hemispheres together. This is what helps us to be able to have a bigger picture um, and to be able to, to um, take a step back and to have more perspective. And so that's compromised. It hasn't been well developed. And that, and that has an impact on the ability to regulate your emotions. And so when you have an individual who has gone through a history of trauma, they're not able to um, use all of their cognitive abilities. They're not able to reason because they're more caught up in the bottom part of their, of their survival brain. And they're also not able to what we call the integrative capacity. The integrative capacity is basically what comes out of the prefrontal cortex. It's all of the executive functioning, what allows you to be able to reflect, to have perspective, to take a step back, to slow things down, to temper yourselves. All of that comes out of the integration. So their brain is caught up with, with um, searching to see if there's danger, being in survival mode, and they're all into their emotions and instincts. So if we go back to that, that image that I showed before, that blue one right here, where it is normal for us to go in and out of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic mode, somebody who has a history of trauma, the difference between them and a person who has not is that they will stay stuck in their modes. So either they will stay stuck in fight response, flight response, or freeze response. And, and I'm sure if you guys took a second to think about the students that you work with, that student that can't stay in class, that anytime something's hard, they avoid or they walk away or they avoid coming to school or the or the little ones that run out of class. That's the flight response that is stuck. The fight response, how many of our students have a hard time using their words, that they're very quick into using their fists or using uh, threats or so forth. Those are kids that are stuck in in fight response and of course the kids that are start that are stuck in freeze response those are the students that are shut down um, and so just to be able to differentiate between this the the fight flight and freeze into the fight we have rage and anger and irritation and frustration and, and this the student is pushing towards um that fight to survive that flight um, um, type of approach is more in terms of having panic, having anxiety, having constant worries and concerns, um, avoiding situations, running away from situations. This is the flight response. The freeze response is one step further in comparison to the fight and flight, because in the fight and flight, at least there's an attempt to try to answer to that danger. The freeze response is the complete giving up believing that we cannot we're so terrorized we feel that we cannot cope that there's nothing left to do but to freeze in terms of dissociating in terms of numbing um in terms of shutting down and so forth all of that is part of the freeze response i would say that the more that our students have a high trauma incident and and the the harder they have the ability to cope the more they will find themselves in that freeze response where they're completely shut down and hard to reach. Um, and so how can we work with these students that find themselves, you know, often in these three types of responses? I mentioned before about the way that our brain will interpret whether or not there's danger in the environment. The term for this is called neuroception. Neuroception is basically the way that our brain will make sense of our world to see whether or not there's danger, whether or not our life is in th is, is uh, there's a threatening situation that's there, whether it's an, in an or, or internal world or outer world or be between our relationships. Neuroception can be faulty, which means that our brain may interpret that there's a danger and truly there is not an actual danger there, but our brain is picking it up like as if there is. And so oftentimes our trauma students are the ones that have what we call a, a faulty neuroception ability. And so they will see danger where there isn't any. Those are the students that will get triggered by so many different situations. And so neuroception is the brain and body's ability um, to to consciously surveil the environment to see if there's threat and danger. So if the neuroception is faulty, then what happens is that the person's body and brain will detect that there's threat when the person is actually safe. And, and alter, alternately, 
it's possible that the brain may detect safety when there's actual risk. And so think about those situations where students find themselves, uh, you know, in um, a violent situation or a bullying situation, and they remain, um, you know, rather than, than, than having the flight response, um, looking for help and so forth, they will try to become friends with these peers that, that are actually quite harmful. And so this could be part of, of um, it, what the, it can explain this is the faulty neuroception. A child with a vulnerable nervous system or a trauma history can mistakenly detect threat in the environment even when that child is safe, triggering the defensive reactions and, and that brings forth that faulty neuroception. Neuroception, by the way, cannot be altered by right thinking. So even if we try to convince the student out of their stress response, that we try to, to, to reassure them that the situation is okay and that they're safe with us, this is such a primitive part of our brain and is meant for survival purposes. There is nothing that we can say or do to, to convince them out of it. And so, so many different types of potential tr uh, triggers that can uh, push, a, a, you know, a, a student who is in trauma to into their trauma response, especially if they have a faulty neuroception. And so it could be through their senses, whether, you know, certain sounds or certain smells or certain things that they may touch that may trigger a memory of a traumatic event. It could be in terms of them feeling deprived of their of their basic needs, whether they feel hunger or they feel thirst or they feel tired. Um, it, all of that could potentially trigger. Um, in terms of bodily sensations, having let's say that they're you know in phys ed and that they're running and all of a sudden their heart starts racing, their brain may interpret that the the racing of the heart is not because of the physical um, exercise, but because there may be danger in the environment. And so we could see how it could trick the brain. And of course, if there's there's pain or pleasure. In terms of certain emotions, certain un unpleasant emotions, feeling shame, for example, could be a trigger for a student or rejection or anything like that. Um, it could even be something that is that is pleasurable, uh, pleasant, like being excited about something that excitement can actually be triggering um, feeling vulnerable, feeling uh, lonely, injustice and so forth. All of these can have an impact. And of course, relational dynamic can also be a trigger where uh, they feel the exercise of authority onto them and that they don't feel safe in that. Um, that there could be some uh, some uh, b boundaries that have been violated, and that again, this could be triggering for them, um, and, and so forth. All of these different elements, I'll, I'll let you read those through, can be potential triggers. There are so many different ways in which complex trauma can impact um, a person from their brain on, whether it's about the way they attach in terms of their their the way that they feel in terms of the way that they dis associate or dissociate from situations in terms of the way that they behave and or manage their behavior in terms of their th their thoughts in terms of their self concept i will not walk through all of these there's so many of them i will let you read them through but it just gives you an idea of how many different ways trauma can impact um, and so it gives you a better idea, a wider picture of all of the different ways in which it can impact. Ultimately, what can happen in terms of the um, you know, extent of that trauma is that it can bring defenses, defenses where the, the person will uh, numb out their emotions, will tune out of, of conversations and situations, may back out of relationships because they don't trust or that they don't feel safe. All of this has an incident on relationships. And so how challenging it can be for us adults that are trying to work one on one or as a small group uh, with with those students and that we're having a hard time getting them to be receptive to us, to get them to trust us, to get them to follow uh, our lead. And so all of this gets in the way. The other place where it has a huge impact is in terms of learning. And so students that have a, a, a history of trauma, have a hard time feeling vulnerability, which means that any type of new learning, especially if it's something that's hard to do, 
can can bring a lot of vulnerability and can push them into flight, fight, or freeze response, where they may avoid to do anything that would lead them into that vulnerable territory. Trying something new, asking questions, presenting new ideas, exploring the unknown. All of this is really challenging for an individual who has a history of trauma. These students may be reluctant to look at their own mistakes and to learn from those mistakes, to attend to their failures, um, because it makes them feel too vulnerable. They find it difficult as well to admit to their inadequacies or, or things that they don't know that they're ignorant about or to confess their confusion, as this would open up their feelings of shame. They rarely ask for assistance from the teacher, as this would create a feeling of dependency and again vulnerability. Um, and so since they cannot feel sad about what's not working for them or vulnerable or afraid, um, then it doesn't give them the opportunity to be able to learn from these situations and to move forward. And so they stay stuck in their learning disabilities. And so oftentimes with these trauma kids, we may think they have a learning disability and really it's not a true learning disability. It is the trauma that's getting in the way. The other piece that I forgot to mention here that I should have mentioned is the fact that trauma also affects memory. And so when you're in survival mode, it is very hard for you to focus and to concentrate and to retrieve certain memories. Or it is possible that your memory plays tricks on you because you are, um, for safety reasons, avoiding um, retrieving certain memories for, for uh, to be able to feel safe. And so all of that has an impact on learning. I want to differentiate for a second the difference between the impact of trauma and what is considered to be normal instead in terms of development and immaturity. Because there's so many different elements that can impact behavior, not just trauma. It could be a certain emotion that pushes us to react a certain way, a certain instinct where we need to take control or that we need to be in survival mode that will impact. Um, in terms of our defenses, I talked about that before. Of course, if a person uh, you know, is hypersensitive or, or that their attachments are not um, where they need to be, that they have a hard time uh, being able to follow the, per the adult's lead, and all of that can have an impact on behavior. The, I showed you before that image of the brain, I'll just show it again, of the left and the right, where you've got the healthy brain and the, the brain that got, has gone through a history of trauma. I'd like to say that the brain here on the left the reason why it was able to fully develop is not just because there was no trauma, but because the right conditions, the favorable conditions were put in place for the brain to be able to be at rest enough to grow. And, and for the brain to grow, this takes time. So if I bring it back to the slide, if you are somebody that works with preschoolers, you work with four-year-olds, five-year-olds, this image here will show um, on the on the left hand side, the image of a five year old and th what the blue and purple is what has been developed in the brain. So you can see for a five year old that there is not much development in the prefrontal cortex. And so developmentally, it is to be expected that a four or five year old will not be able to regulate their emotions, even if they had had not a history of trauma. Um, you see here an image of a preteen. And so think about, you know, your students in um, grade five and six, for those that work in elementary, uh, that even if they have had, they've not had a history of trauma, that their brain developmentally has not fully developed. And so they're not able to access all of the fruits of it just yet. So it's only those that work in high school. And even then, look here, it says teen brain, that there's, there's a beginning of development, but really it's not until the, the early 20s or 30s that the brain has been fully developed. And so even those that, that are here today that are listening to this presentation and you work with high school students, not all high school students have developed completely their prefrontal cortex. And so it's not just a question of whether or not there's been trauma. It's also a question of whether or not they've been at rest enough to develop those abilities. And so those immature students that you work with, their reactions are not tempered like the adults in their prefrontal cortex. And I should mention adults that have matured because by the way, maturation is not inevitable. You can grow older, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you've grown up. 
And so we can even find adults in our society that do, have not fully developed their abilities in their brain. And so our immature individuals will, will be more reactive, more unfiltered. Um, and it's it's it to be expected developmentally if they haven't been able to um, develop those processes. I'm not going to take too much time on this because um, we've got so much material to cover. I just wanted to mention briefly that there are uh, three elements. Sorry, I'm just going to. Oh, here, I'm going to click on them. There are three elements that allow, that allow for the brain to unfold, to develop and to become mature. Those three elements are the ability to be emergent, the ability to be adaptive and the ability to integrate your thinking. So I'm just going to, to show you briefly what these are. So I'm just going to open them all up. Oops, I'm just going to open them all up. Emergence means that we're able to be curious, that we want to learn, that we're able to have our own ideas and values, that we're able to feel responsible for things, to be independent, to be aware of others' boundaries. Um, in terms of adaptation, to be able to learn from your mistakes, to accept limits and restrictions, to be resilient and resourceful. And integration is to allow for you to be considerate of others, to be able to have good self-regulation, to be patient, to be courageous, to have perspective. All of these things take time to develop, which means that the students that you're working with, if they are immature, even if they do not have a history of trauma, it could be explained by a lack of development, but you need to keep in mind that those kids that do indeed have a history of trauma, oh my goodness, do they have a harder time to be able to be successful in these different elements because their brain has not fully developed. And so even if they, they um, know better, they cannot do better when they are in their stress response. And so just to be able to differentiate between trauma and Im immaturity. And so the points that trauma and immaturity have in common. And so there's going to be challenges in the executive functionings uh, in terms of organization, time management, task initiation, planning, problem solving. All of these things come once we have fully developed our prefrontal cortex. They may lack impulse control and um, have difficulty uh, knowing and describing their emotion, their internal state. They may have difficulty, as I was saying before, to adapt to new things, to transitions. Oh my goodness, how many of our kids have a hard time with transitions? To limits and mistakes and failures. Have a difficulty with sitting still, to be able to have full attention onto a certain situation for a, a larger period of time. These are to be expected with immature students. What we can say though that will set apart immaturity from trauma is that in a trauma individual, the amygdala will not be well calibrated and it will react highly. And I mentioned to you before that we'll talk about that. It's on my next slide. In terms of defenses that are there, they have attachment issues. They get triggered easily. Uh, sensory experience can be overwhelming for the trauma kids. And they may have issues around sleep, food, mental health, and so forth. And so these are the different elements that are one step beyond all of the other ones that are common between trauma and immaturity. So now I, I want to show you a chart to be able to compare a, a, a person who is healthy, that has, is, is neurotypical, that has not gone through a history of trauma, and how they react to stress versus a, what we call a sensitized individual and our trauma kids will fit into that category. And then we'll talk about the resilient kids. So I'll explain the way that the, this uh, chart works. So from the left to the right, you have the, the degree of stress in that person's environment where we go from daily challenges in the classroom to moderate stress in the day to day to distress and threatening situations on at the most on the right. From the bottom to the top, we're going to talk about the emotional state uh, or the stress response of that person. So at the bottom, we look at a state of calm to being more alert, to being now alarmed, to being afraid and now being completely terrorized. We will notice in that line in the middle that the neurotypical individual who has not gone through a history of trauma, their emotional state, their stress response is actually quite proportionate to the situation at hand. And so that's to be expected. Now I wanna bring your attention to that line here on the left. Look how quickly, just within daily challenges, how quickly this spikes 
from a state of calm to alert to uh, to alert to alarm to fear. This is what we mean by a kindled amygdala, which means that the stress response will react in an in an exponential type of way, where not only will the person um, go from a state of calm to being alert, but very quickly they will jump almost steps where they will get to a state of almost terror just within daily challenges. And then the rest will taper off as it gets more, more uh, proportionate to the situation at hand. Now, the attention that I want to bring to you now is to that line here at the bottom where it says the resilient student. Ideally, this is what we want to do with our students. We want to help them to become more resilient, to be able to manage. Look at that line down here within daily challenges where they're able to stay calm, collected and and and, and face stressors in their learning as long as it's it's a, a moderate or, you know, or just a daily challenge. The key element to building resiliency is the sense of safety. How can we help our students feel safe? But before we get to there, I want to look at the fundamentals that we need to adopt within our schools. If we want to be trauma informed, if we want to put together a team of, of, um, of um, adults that are trauma informed, what are the fundamentals that we need to keep in mind? First of all, before we get into what we could be putting in place, I want to bring your attention to what we should be careful about. First of all, many adults, especially when there's a frustrating situation or that it's not working, we tend to start talking more. We tend to, to, to start reasoning, to talk about, you know, the consequences of things. You have to understand that with a trauma student, the more we talk, the more we trigger them the more we push them into high arousal and it brings them to their flight fight mode and it intensifies their dysregulation. If we have a trauma student who is upset, we need to minimize our talking to be able to not trigger them further. Because when they are in survival mode, not only are they triggered by our talking, but they're also not hearing what it is that we're saying. Um, there's studies that have shown that the first thing that that um, is non-functional when when you are in survival mode is your auditory processing, which means that we are not hearing the words of what the person is telling us. So even if you're trying to uh, reassure them, you're trying to get them to calm down, what they're paying attention to is your body language and your tone. And so you need to be careful if you are talking too loudly, if you're talking too fast, and, and um, in terms of the volume, in terms of their tone, we need to be careful about that and minimizing the quantity of talking. Um, and so, and the other thing too, is that of course, they're, they're searching just for threats in the environment. Remember I was talking about neuroception before and them scanning for threats. And so if they feel in our tone that we're upset with them, then of course th this will trigger them further because they will not feel safe in the dynamic. Um, and so that's one piece that we need to be mindful of. The other piece that we need to be mindful of is the stress curve. Where is the student at in their stress response? Are they lightly stressed? Are they somewhat a bit more stressed? Are they overly stressed or are they completely completely uh, on the most extreme of the stress level to a point where they are shut down. The reason why we need to pay attention to this is because depending on where they're at in their stress level, they will become less and less receptive to what to what we need to do in our interventions. And so sometimes our best intervention in those moments where they're the most highly stressed is actually to take a step back and to give them breathing room and to allow for the stress to come down a little bit before we intervene. If we step in, especially in terms of physical proximity and that we're getting into their space, into their bubble and that they're feeling threatened in that, we will just trigger them further. And so it's so important that we're attuned to where they're at in their stress curve and that we do not intervene when they're at their most stressed. Um, Ross Green, who wrote the book, The Explosive Child, I'm sure many of you have heard Ross Green. He presented last year at a conference in the US on trauma 
And one of the things that he talked about, especially with our trauma students, is all of the conventional approaches that we use in the classroom that might work for a neurotypical individual who doesn't have too much um, trauma or stress. But for our, our trauma kids, these things are considered too late and do not work if they are upset. And so when we expect, so, so one example is when we expect a dysregulated trauma student to ask for help or to take that break on their own, or to go to that common corner or that alternative space that we have available in the building, or that we ask them to use their coping strategies. When they are dysregulated to this point here, they, we cannot expect them to be able to do this. They are not able to do that in that moment. Or that if we're at the point where we don't have a choice to de-escalate the situation or to request for additional support from a colleague because things have gotten too far or that we need to resort to restraints and isolation and ultimately to refer to reflection to the uh, reflection room if you have one to the principal's office for disciplinary measures. All of these different measures do not work with our, our trauma kids. They are considered too late. They cannot learn from these situations. We need to be more um, preventative and proactive with them for, for things to work. And so part of the fundamentals that we need to keep in mind within our trauma informed schools, the best approach are systemic, not piecemeal. There must be a buy in from the top and the bottom. And, and what top and bottom meaning in terms of the staff within a school and within a school board, emotional and behavioral support cannot be addressed only at in a 10 minute morning meeting or every Thursday fourth period. It has to be in an everyday thing. It has to become part of the school's DNA. And um, there's there needs to be a common vision, a language among and a common language among all stakeholders. It, it has to be integrated into leadership, instruction, faculty meetings, family engagement, hire, uh, hiring procedures and policies and so forth. What I'm trying to say here is that the presentation I'm giving you today on trauma is a first step, but we cannot have a true trauma informed school without having everybody in your team involved. Taking this, you know, for example, this training, speaking the same language, planning together as a team, how will we best support our trauma students within our building? Again, uh, the best efforts towards emotional and behavioral support need to be proactive, not reactive. Being proactive means that we don't wait for the problems to arise and deal with them only then. We adopt measures to prevent them. Um, and so, as I mentioned before in this slide, because when they're upset, they're not able to be attuned to us and hear us, they're not receptive to us sharing strategies and tools and so forth. They need to be in a state of calm in order to receive this information and to explore different avenues. And so in schools, this means a shift of mindset from focusing primarily on having students following rules to supporting students preventatively by creating emotional safe spaces. And so this is where you guys get into, into that role as an SET, is that rather than waiting for the teacher to send you the student that is upset, you need to find time and space to work with that student outside of the incidences to be able to find moments when they are calm and receptive and that you guys are connecting, that you can work together on certain things. Um, and so it's, it's so as I was saying, it's about prevention. Not only are students more receptive when it is done preventatively, but us too as adults, we do our better work in the preventative mode. It's really difficult to have um, you know, the most effective strategies when we're in crisis management. Um, you know, in crisis management, even ourselves, we are triggered and that we do the best, but it's really not the most optimal types of situations. The other piece that, my goodness, is so important for us as a team, not just for USCT, is to discuss these student cases, to discuss, you know, what are those triggers for that student? What are those strategies that work better for them? And so forth, being able to take a step back, to look at it from a macro level, to be able to reflect on different strategies and seeing what works and what doesn't, to come together as a team to discuss this. So not just the teacher alone or you guys separately or the administrator separately, it, it needs to become a team effort where we do this together. Uh, and so ultimately, it's about teamwork. 
not just for us to be on the same page, but also to be able to share the weight and the responsibility of those students. No single adult should be fully responsible on a full time basis for these complex cases. It is too much for any single adult. We are meant to share the, the weight of these kids. We're meant to do this together as a team to build a village of support, to collaborate uh, and to have good communication among us. Without that, we are not going to be effective with our trauma kids. Because they're so highly challenging and that it becomes taxing for any single adult over time. So in terms of um, best practices to help build that resiliency, I mentioned before um, the, the sense of safety, that safety is one of the key elements to help build resiliency in students. Now, uh, before I get to the three, the three elements, uh, in case you don't know what resilience means, resilience is basically our ability to be able to bounce back from a, trust, a stressful situation. So it doesn't mean that it didn't stress us. It doesn't mean that it didn't affect us, but even though we were affected and stressed, we are still able to work through it and to bounce back from it. it will, it's not something that will affect us deeply. And this is the difference, by the way, between resilience and trauma. Trauma is that event that will happen that we have not bounced back from, that has affected us so deeply that it has left a scar. And so that's the difference between resilience and trauma. And so safety is the starting point. The thing about safety, however, it's safety is tricky because you cannot make somebody feel safe. You cannot make them feel safe by telling them that the environment is secure. You cannot convince them of this. It's not an intellectual exercise. It is actually a very primitive and instinctual um, type of, of experience. Um, to be at rest by trying to control their behavior, to pushing them to be at rest or demanding that they're calm, this is not something that will work. To be able to help them feel their emotions and to be healthy in the way that um, that they build their abilities and so forth, you can teach the words of emotions, but you cannot teach somebody to feel, especially if they have defenses, nor to be able to regulate those emotions. You can also not make somebody be happy by imposing a right or a positive type of thinking. And ultimately, you cannot push anybody to, to be optimal in their functioning, even if we teach or command it. These are things that come from a very different place in the brain. And so reaching emotional well-being doesn't stem from our thinking brain. It doesn't come from the neocortex, nor from our executive functioning, the prefrontal cortex. It is actually rooted in our primitive brain and our limbic system. Therefore, safety, the starting point, is not about what we're saying or, or what we're saying to the student or trying to convince them. It's through the conditions that we set up to help them feel safe, and then the rest will unfold naturally. Now, what do I mean by conditions? I'm going to talk about that in a moment, but before I get to the conditions, I want to say, and I, I mentioned this earlier, safety, is, you know, if we go back to the, co the concept of neuroception, is in the eye of the beholder. It's not something that we can convince, as I said before, even if the environment is safe, if the brain is picking up that there's something dangerous, whether it's, it is true or not, this is where the brain is going to be headed. Um, and so this is a, a, a brain level type of exercise. And so uh, I, I mentioned this already in terms of the neuroception. Sorry, I'm repeating myself here. Uh, and, and this is the book, by the way, from Mona de la Hook called Beyond Behaviors. And she talks about this in her book. So how do we go about fostering a sense of safety for our students? And I mentioned some of that through uh, the fundamentals that I talked about before, which, which uh, in terms of uh, prevention, because if we wait for crisis management, they will not feel safe. Working preventatively makes a difference. And of course, working as a team, offering check-ins with our students. So it's not just waiting for incidences to happen, is that we actually schedule check-ins where we're able to have a one-to-one -one and to see where they're at. In terms of the relationship that we have with them, and this is where it gets tricky. Even if you are a warm, present adult and that you're showing interest, there is no 
there's no true influence there until they're at that place where they are willing to trust you. These things take time. It's not because you're nice and you like them that it means that they will feel safe with you and follow you. Um, these are things that need to be proven and that takes time in all of your, your exchanges with that student that you're working with. And so please be patient. It's to be expected that those trauma kids have a harder time to trust because of the history that they've gone through where they have been um, burnt before. It, you know, they have that history that, that makes them more wary about adults. Um, in terms of being reflected and regulated within the adult interventions, that, that we show a stance where we are confident, but yet warm with them, Th that we don't use discipline methods that cause more separation, that we use, for example, consequences, um, in, in not, con not natural consequences, but I mean consequences that are trying to control that behavior. Um, in terms of having structure in routine, trauma kids need pr predictability. They need to know where they're heading. They need to have a sense of, of constants and continuation, feeling that the environment has been set up intentionally for their needs in terms of sensory and, and, and social and so forth, being mindful of that. All of these things are needed and necessary to foster a sense of safety. Um, in terms of um, safety also, Part of it is for us to help them to regulate their emotions. They cannot do this by themselves. And so not only do we need to be careful about our own emotions and that we try to the best of our abilities to remain regulated, they need us to be able to co-regulate together, even at the high school level. So those that are here today listening to this presentation, this is not just for elementary um, level students, also for high school. So many high school students have a hard time managing their emotions. They need that adult not just to model it, but to do it with them, to help them, uh, you know, um, cue them and to what it, what it is that, that will help them to get back to that state of calm. And so, of course, uh, you know, if the adult is dysregulated, even if the child is regulated, this may trigger the student further into dysregulation. Um, and so it's so important for us to keep in mind that we ourselves are regulated. And by the way, I mean, we're, we're human. And so we have our good and bad days. And this goes back to the importance of teamwork. If you are, are in the place where you're being triggered by the student and that all of your interventions seem to be triggering the situation further, you need to tap out and to have a, a colleague step in um, to, to be able to, to, that would be more regulated to be able to help the situation through. Or if you do not have a colleague that can step into the, that situation, then it's so important that we take a step back uh, rather than trying to push forward and that we're so focused on our agenda and to be able to, to affect that change, we need to be more focused on the conditions and making sure that the student is feeling safe with where we're at with our own energy. And so this is all about sense of safety. The second element that uh, works towards building resiliency is setting up some time for students to express their emotions. Many times we have the reflex to focus on uh, right thinking to get to try to convince them out of a situation, whether it's focusing on being positive, pursuing happiness, resisting that that situation that might let us down and to pursue calmness and tranquility at all cost. We're actually working against the nature of emotions. We're not meant to to contain an emotion. We're meant to let emotion run its course. That's what that wave is about, by the way. And so if you let emotions run their course, so for example, a student who's frustrated and that needs to let out their frustration, if you try to contain that frustration, even if you were successful at containing it, I promise you this frustration has not dissipated. It will just come out later. And so we need to find time and space to let students release that emotion, whether it is frustration, whether it is fear or whatever type of emotion they may have, we need to give them outlets to be able to let that out. Mark Brackett, who wrote the book Permission to Feel, said the following in his book, emotion regulation is not about exerting tight control over what we feel. 
And it's not about banishing negative emotions and feeling only the positive ones. Rather, emotion regulation starts with giving ourselves and others the permission to own our feelings, all of those feelings. And so I'm not saying that we should let students, uh, you know, be aggressive and to hurt other students in the classroom or in the hallway. Of course, you know, we need to establish safety for all. But can we build some time and space in their days it, through channels, through mediums, where they, they can find ways to be able to release that accumulated emotion? Evidence related to suppressing emotions show consequences on physical health, mental health, and general well-being. And so the more that we work on trying to contain and suppressing their you know, students' emotions, the more this will impact their attention, their concentration, and their memory. Um, the more they will have high daily emotional stress and emotional dysregulation. As I mentioned before, if you contain it, it hasn't disappeared. It will just come out later. And so all we're doing is delaying and accumulating emotion. It will have and it may have a negative social functioning um, with the student because of the way that their emotions are getting in the way and it can create problems in their, their relationships and more conflict. The number of physical aggressions and bullying incidences may increase. This may have an impact on mental health conditions, including anxiety and depression. And of course, it can, this can have a long term health an impact on health problems and on the body, whether it's insomnia, poor digestion, and more. And so what we need to do is to come alongside the person's feelings. I'm not saying that we should we should give the behavior permission. We need to separate that per, the, the behavior and the emotions where we can normalize and validate those emotions, still not be in agreement with the behavior, but at least validate those emotions at the base and give them outlets and other types of, of um, uh, strategies and and um, outlets to be able to let out that emotion. Uh, in terms of tears, um, studies have shown that there are different types of tears that we can we can uh, cry to laughter, we can cry to cutting onions, we can cry to um, um, even you know watching a movie or whatnot. The, the, the having that good cry, being able to have those tears of grief, being able to let let go of of that frustration or that that fear and bring them to those tears, those deeps, you know, what we call tears of futility, really helps in terms of releasing that stress. It helps to release the the cortisol, and it helps also to bring in oxytocin, which helps for mood regulation. And so, can we make space for students to find their tears? I'm not telling you to make them cry. What I'm saying is. If they do get to their tears, can we make time and space for those tears to happen? Emotions, emotion has vital work to do. However, it can be difficult for some students to express it. And so if tears cannot happen for some students, how about we try to find these non-threatening play mode that can allow for emotions to express themselves safely? Now, of course, for our little ones, uh, oh, Give me a second. I'm just going to our little ones. It, it it feels more natural to be able to play out your emotions, whether we're using imaginary play or puppets or role playing or whatever that is. It, it, it's so much easier, you know, with the little ones. But even with our high school students, oh, my goodness, through through, um, um, you know, drama, role playing. Um, slam poetry and all sorts of different ways. There are different um, structures in which we can create outlets for them to let out those emotions. Um, and so to be able to make room for that. Um, and, and of course, expressing emotions doesn't just mean with words. It's OK for them to be able to let out emotions without talking. You don't have to talk about about what's not working for you to be able to let it out. This can be done through music. It could be done through art. It could be done in so many different ways. Uh, and so to make room for, um, you know, journaling, music, art um, through, um, you know, different types of activity, drawing, music activity. These come from from uh, this book, this inside out handbook. Um, that is connected to uh, the Reclaiming Our Students book from Hannah Beach. You have this free inside out handbook. I put all the links there for you to go and take a look. 
And so in that handbook, you've got an activity on drawing the music in terms of that, um, the, the, the sensation body map, um, being able to draw the shape of your feelings, stories and role playing, having a sensory treasure box where, where students can explore their, their sensory through these different things. All of these can be tools that you can have within the spaces that you work with students and to be able to use these different activities that are free, by the way, if you have a copy of the Reclaiming Our Student. In terms of the third key element, which is helping them find their courage, we have a misunderstanding about resilience. We think that resilience is being strong. It's about coping, and you, that couldn't be further from the truth. Resilience actually can be quite vulnerable as an emotion, and so resilience is not coping. Coping is about powering through. It's about managing the situation, whereas resilience that comes from adaptation is actually an emotional journey. And so there's nothing wrong with us feeling afraid. There's nothing wrong with us feeling overwhelmed or stressed and so forth. It's not about that to become resilient. It's about allowing ourselves to bounce back from that, to find our, our, our strength and our confidence. And so how can we help students build that strength and confidence? Part of it is, is through the way that we accompany them in their emotions and having that empathy, being careful in the way that we say certain things where we may say something that may dismiss and invalidate, like saying, don't be silly. There's nothing to be scared. Uh, they're scared about. You see everything turned out fine. Uh, you worried for nothing. And we're not saying this in, in a sarcastic, condescending way. We're trying to be helpful in that situation. But unfortunately, these are not helpful. And so it's not because we make space for emotions and that we validate and normalize them that we're going to be stuck for hours trying to manage those emotions. If we go back to this image um, back here, sorry, I'm just going to backtrack for a second. Here, the more that we stay stuck and try to work against emotions, we're, we're, we're not we're turning in circles and we're not passing. If we let emotions run their course, emotions have a beginning and an end naturally they will release themselves if we can make room for th for them with empathy um and so how can we help them uh, cultivate that sense of strength and courage um to help them in an in an indirect non-threatening way to help them experience things that might be fearful for them or stressful um, it, can, it could be done through different types of emotional playgrounds. It could be that we talk about a character in a story that did something really scary and that was able to face their fear. So many different ways in which we can do this, help them experiment trying something new, making a mistake and, and, and facing difficult challenges without repercussions. And so doing this in, in what we call the play mode. So there's not true, we're not looking for results and it, there's not true repercussions. And so these are things that, that you know, one on one with students that you're working with, how can we help them attain that, um, you know, outside of the classroom? In terms of uh, the CBM pyramid of intervention and every single presentation that I do, I talk about the pyramid. I presented it to some of you last year. Um, there's tons and tons of materials and, and recordings on the on the website on this. And so it's basically the three tiered approach to trauma. And so for all having universal practices that are trauma-informed, having school-wide support, having whole class approaches that even if some students don't need it because they don't have a history of trauma, all students can benefit from trauma-informed practices. In terms of for some students, being able to have small group support, having more targeted practices, and at, at the few tier three students having more personalized one-to-one -one support, and those practices are more individualized. So what I did in, in this PowerPoint is I walked through from tier one to two to three, all of the different measures that we could put in place that are trauma informed. Um, and because my audience today is mostly support staff, I'm not going to walk through in detail all of these slides. I'm going to focus mostly on support staff, but keep in mind that there are uh, practices that we can do for everybody in terms of safety, in terms of belonging, in terms of giving them times to have breaks, to find respite, to be able to release those emotions. There's ways that we could do this, that the teacher could do this as a, with their whole group, to find ways to express their emotions um, and to be able to find their strength and to work through ex executive functioning development. For support staff at tier one, 
it's possible that some of you are working in collaboration with the teachers in the classroom. Um, and so if you are in that role that you're supporting the teacher in the classroom, then then you could get involved in, in the, the when, where, how some of the support measures can be addressed. Um, that, that you too, you know, if ever, you know, the teacher, uh, you know, is doing something with part of the group and you're with other part of, or part of the group, that you too could be working on cultivating that sense of belonging, doing those emotional release activities and so forth at tier one. This is during class time. During um, transitions, during uh, being in the schoolyard, there too we could be working on universal best practices. And so how can we maximize the schoolyard and to make it into a safe space so students know that when they're out there, that they're that that everything's been thought through in terms of, of dividing the yard into clear sections, grouping students in an in intentional way, having games and activities that have been thought out and that have been organized, having a schedule uh, that is predictable and um, having students that may help with animation and supervision, having materials that is available outside to be able to play games. All of these things are needed and necessary at tier one. In terms of indoor recess, and so during the months of the year that there's snow and ice, could we set up something more structured and organized? And I've got a whole web page dedicated to this on how to structure indoor recess. I invite you to go and take a look at this at the web page. You've got the link right here. Um, and so, and of course, during transitions, if you guys are outside with the kids, how can we be part of animating some of these structured activities to be able to introduce and to model how to play the games properly, to oversee some of these games, to to uh, organize, um, to have other students, especially our grade six, and and um, that you know for elementary to be there to to oversee even in high school. How can we help in high school have older students that could help uh, mentor or or or, um, or or be a big brother or big sister to some of our grade sevens, and to be able to organize that during lunch and break. In terms of tier two. We have other suggested practices for the exact same elements that I brought forth at tier one, but now we're bringing it one step further where we're doing this into small groups, those that may need further support than tier one, and that we're, ta we're, we're tailoring it a bit more. Um, and so I've got a bunch of different examples here. And so for support staff, it may be that you're doing student check-ins in small group uh, and to go beyond just the teacher greeting that you may be supporting this, the teacher in introducing and modeling the use of tools and materials that are assigned to the student that may help them with stress management, um, that you are involved in scheduling those breaks um, and, and everything that needs to happen during those breaks for those students, animating small groups during recess and lunch, um, whether it's to give them some respite or to be able to help them work on social development or emotional development, and, I, and I've got some examples there. And, and of course, um, using different types of materials, helping the teacher into offering those to help them with some of the executive uh, executive function challenges. And so at tier two, it may be that you offer structured small group games and activities in this in a, in a reserved section in the yard. It could be that some students have what we call a supported recess and lunch and that they come to you in an alternative space and that they are um, have a snack with you or that they're doing an activity with you. And this could be done indoors or outdoors. Some students need to have what we call an extended recess. And so it could be five or 10, 10, 10 or 15 minutes before or after because they have a hard time with transitions that we will give them time before or after the bell to help them to cope better during transitions. In terms of tier three, now we're upping the ante in terms of intensity and individualization of the support measures. And so uh, oftentimes at tier three, we're doing one to one work and we're doing this in alternative spaces outside of the classroom. And so for those schools that have a nurturing support center or you have a, a functioning oasis or another type of room um, to be able to offer support one to one for those students having a, a place where students can go and reset their amygdala and where they need to work on co-regulation with you, where we give them some activities to be able to release those emotions and re re express those emotions as well. Um, 
and and of course for support staff again implementing those one to one daily check ins being involved in the adapted schedule and supporting the student in alternate locations, whether the nurturing support center or other introducing and modeling while in the nurturing support center or other spaces the use of tools and materials which can be assigned to that student that will help them with the, with their emotions creating materials if needed and supporting and collaborating with the teacher or other um, staff that are involved during debriefing sessions so important at tier three that we um that all the same all the adults are on the same page some schools may have an emotions room um, and so beyond the nurturing support center, you may have a space where students can go with the right outlets, with the right materials to be able to let out those emotions. Um, and so the, if you want to know more about the emotions room, there's a link here to go and take a look. Same thing with the nurturing support center. If you don't have one in your school and that's something that may interest you, I invite you to go and take a look at this link. Um, in terms of trends of, of um, support during transition times, whether it's uh, recess, lunch, uh, daycare, school bus, whatnot. Um, this document was built mostly for elementary. Um, if you want to see the whole document, you can go and take a look at it on this page here. And so in general, for our CBM website, you've got the link cbm.ca, which will also bring you to the resource center where there's tons and tons of materials and resources available. And I have a whole section dedicated to trauma. And I added at the end of my presentation um, a few editorials uh, that are from Mona de la Hook, who wrote the book Beyond Behaviors. Um, and I invite you to go if you're interested to read these articles, and I'm sure there are more that are available. And so I uh, thank you so much for your time. It's been a, a bit of a marathon through this material. I'm going to stop the recording and um, thank you so much. Uh, wait, that's not what I want to do. I want to stop the recording. Stop recording. There we go.